17 years and is the former guild mistress. She has also been seen on our stages as Lady Macbeth, as Nerissa, and as Titania. She is ably assisted by Jan Westerhouse, our resident speech therapist and makeup coordinator. Valerie. Thanks for coming out on this very cold day. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, Jan and I have had the pleasure of working with two extremely talented young actors who I wouldn't be surprised if we see them on Broadway someday. All I'm going to say about their scene is you're going to see something with just a little bit of a twist. Where are you going? Over hill, over hill, over valley, through, through bush, through briar, through water, through water, through fire. I wander everywhere faster than the moon revolves around the earth. I work for Titania, the fairy queen, and organize fairy dances for her in the grass. The cowslip flowers are her bodyguards. You'll see that they have spots on them. Those are rubies, fairy gifts. Their sweet smells come from those little freckles. Now, I have to go find some dewdrops and hang a pearl earring on every cowslip ear. Goodbye, you dumb old spirit. I've got to go. The queen and her elves will be here soon. The king's having a party here tonight. Just make sure the queen doesn't come anywhere near him because King Oberon is extremely angry. He's furious because she stole an adorable boy from the Indian king. She's never kidnapped such a darling human child before. And Oberon's jealous. He wants the child for himself to accompany him on his wandering through the wild forest. But the queen refuses to hand the boy over to Oberon. Instead, she puts flowers in the boy's hair and makes a fuss over him. And now Oberon and Titania refuse to speak to each other or meet each other anywhere. These are in the forest, nor on the plain, nor by the river, nor under the stars. They always argue. And the little fairies get so frightened that they hide in a corn cup to won't come out. Unless I'm mistaken, <coughs> you're that mischievous and naughty spirit called Robin Goodfellow. Aren't you the one who goes around scaring the maidens in the village, stealing the cream from the top of the milk, and screwing up the flour mills, and frustrating housewives by keeping their milk from turning into the butter? Aren't you the one who keeps beer from foaming us up as it should, causes people to get lost at night while you laugh at them? Some people call you hobgoblin and sweet pop, and you're nice to them. You do their work and give them good luck. You're, you're that one, right? <laughs> what you say is true. That's me you're talking about. The playful wander of the night. I tell jokes to over and make him smile. Sometimes I hide at the bottom of an old woman's drink, disguised as an apple. And when she takes a sip, I bob up against her lips and make her spill the drink all over her wizard old neck. <laughs> Sometimes a wise old woman with a sad story to tell tries to sit down on me, thinking I'm a three-legged stool. But I slip from underneath her, and she falls down crying, Ow, my foot! Ow, my foot! <laughs> and starts coughing. Then everyone laughs and has fun. But step aside, fairy. Here comes over. And here's my mistress. Titania, I wish he'd go away. <laughs> well, that was fun. Do you want to do it again? I don't know if the audience will want to hear the exact same scene again. Well, I didn't exactly mean the exact same scene. How 
about we do it now like they do it in the field theater, you know? Using the old-fashioned language that Shakespeare wrote? Do you think they'll understand it? I'm pretty sure they will. They're a smart bunch, you know? And probably switch roles this time. Switch roles? Are you kidding me? I don't want to do fairy. I'm a guy, duh. Chill, dude. This is a garden. We have imagination. We are creative. We can think outside of the box. Gosh, first you want me to do it the way Shakespeare wrote, and now you want me to switch roles? I don't think I can do both. Okay, I understand. How about we just do it again, same role, but Shakespearean language. You are persistent. Okay, I'll have a go at it. Ready? <laughs> How now, spirit? Wizard wander you. Over hill, over dale, through bush, through briar, over park, over pale, through flood, through fire. I do wander everywhere swifter than the moon's sphere. And I serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tall her pensioners be. In their gold coat spots you see those be rubies, fairy favorite. In those freckles live their savor. Now I must go seek some dewdrops here and hang a pearl on every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lob of spirit. I'll be gone. The queen and all our elves come here and knock. The king's up, keep his ruffles here tonight. Take heed, the queen come not with faint sight. For a one's passing fell in wrath, because that she at her attendant hath a lovely boy stolen from an Indian king. She's never had so sweet a chain join. And jealous Oberon would have the child, knight of his train to trace the force smile. But she perforce reports to the long boy crowns him with flowers and makes them all her joy. And now they never meet in grove or green by fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen. But they do square that all their elves for fear creep in acorn cups and hide them there. Unless I mistake your shape or making quite. You are that shrewd and knavish sprite called Robin Goodfellow. Are you not he who frights the maidens of the villagery? Scoop milk and sometimes labor in the quern? And bootless make the breakfast housewife churn, and sometime make the drink bear no barn, mislead night wanderers laughing at their harm. Those that hobgoblin call you and sweet pop, you do their work and they shall have good luck. Are you not he? Thou speak, sister, right. I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest to Oberon and make him smile. Sometime lurk I in gossip bowl, in fair likeness of a roasted crab. And when she drinks against her lips I bob, and on her wizard gulak pour the ale, the wisest ant telling the saddest tale. Sometime for three foot stool mistaken of me, then slip I her bum down topple she, and Taylor, Taylor cries, and falls into a cough. Then the whole choir folds their hips and laughs, and wax it in their mirth and knees and swear a merrier hour was never wasted there. But room, fairy, here comes Oberon. And here my mistress would would that he were gone. by Henry Moncure, a true Renaissance man. Um, he has been directing at the Young Actors Workshop since its inception, so he has a lot of experience with this. By day, uh, he is an attorney with Bank of America, but by night and weekend, he shines on our stages doing Shakespeare. Some of my favorite Henry roles, get off here. Some of my favorite Henry roles are Rodrigo in Othello, uh, Dogberry and Much Ado About Nothing, and last year's Albany in King Lear. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and we're going to over the years, I've uh, done many scenes from Henry V. I've done the 
love scenes from Henry V. I've done the battle scenes from Henry V. Today, we're going to do the diplomacy scenes from Henry V. It is my goal, ultimately, to have it done all of the scenes from Henry V, and then I'm going to stitch together the DVDs, and I will have produced a movie of Henry V in my vision. <laughs> Uh, so it's several different scenes. Our opening scene is in the English court, where Henry V, played by Tiernan Harcourt, wrote, and the Duke of Exeter, played by Colin Davidson, are consulting with the Archbishop of Canterbury, played by Nicholas Curley, as to whether or not England has a legitimate claim to the French throne. They are met by the ambassador from France, played by Sarah Stovacek, who insults Henry V, delivering a gift from the Dauphin. Our next scene is in the French court, where the King of France, played by Leanne Harcourt Brooke, and the Dauphin, played by Pierre Paolo Argueta, consult along with Montjoy their herald as to the French strategy, and the marshal, or constable rather, of France, who is double played again by Nicholas Curley. He will have a different costume, so you'll know when he's the Archbishop of Canterbury and when he is the Constable of France. Our play concludes with the scenes in the Battle of Agincourt, where the French herald continues to demand the surrender of Henry V until things don't go so well for the French. With that, places. The diplomacy scenes from Henry V. My learned lord, we pray to proceed, and justly and religiously unfold, whether sunny law should or should not bar us in our plan. God doth know how many, now in hell, shall drop the blood and aggravation of what your reverence shall like to do. Therefore, take heed how you unfold our birth. Then hear me, gracious sovereign. There is no bar to make against her highness' claim to France, but this. No woman shall succeed in Sally Glenn. Which Sully Glenn, the French unjustly glows to be the relative. Yet their own authors faithfully affirm Glenn Sully is in Germany, while Charles the Great, having subdued the Saxons, holding in disdain the German woman for some dishonest matters of their life, established on this law. So that as clear as the summer sun, the whole right and title of female, so do the kings of France unto this day. May I with right and conscience make this claim? Gracious Lord, stand for your own, unwind your bloody flag. Send in the message sent from the Dolphin. Tell us the Dolphin's mind. Your Highness lately sent into France to claim some certain dukedoms. In answer of which claim, the Prince our master says that you savor too much of your youth, and bids you be advisers not in France that can be with a nimble galliard one. You cannot revel in the dukedom of them. He therefore sends you this treasure, and in lieu of this desires that you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. This the Dolphin speaks. What treasure, Uncle? Tennis balls, my lady. <laughs> We are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. For his present and your pains, we thank you for. We understand him well. High comes over us with our wilder days, not measure we make of them. Tell this pleasant prince, this mock of his, has turned his balls to gunstone, and his soul shall stand sore charged of righteous vengeance that shall fly with them. When many a thousand went out to this his mock, mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers and their sons, mock Catherine's down. And many get ungotten and unborn shall have cause to curse the Dauphin for. Tell you the Dauphin, I am coming on. And tell the Dauphin, his jest is savored in but shallow wit, when thousands more weep than did laugh. Fare you well. This was a merry message. You have to make the sender blush at us. Therefore, my lords, amid no happy hour, we now know no thought in us but France. Thus comes the English with full power upon us, and more than carefully thus concerns to answer royally in our defenses. My most redoubted father, let us do it with no show of fear. No, with no more than if we heard that England were busied with a Moorish dance. For my good liege, she is so oddly king, her scepter so fantastically borne by a vain, giddy, shallow, humorous youth that fear tends her not. O oh, peace, Prince Dolphin, you're too much mistaken in this king. Question your graceful late ambassadors with what great state here in their embassy. How well is supplied with noble counselors, how modest an exception, and with all how terrible and constant resolution. <coughs> you shall find that his vanities will recover discretion to cope with folly. Think we King Harry strong, and 
Prince, look you stronger to meet him. Ambassadors from Harry, King of England, do crave bits to your majesty. Coward dogs most spend their mouths when what they seem to threaten runs far before them. From her brother, England? From him, and thus he greets your majesty. He wills you, in the name of God Almighty, that you divest yourself of the borrowed glories that by law of nature and of nations belong to him. Or else, what follows? Bloody constraint. For if you hide the crown, even in your hearts, there will he rake for it, in fierce tempest he coming, in thunder and in earthquake. If requiring fail, he will compel, and bids you deliver up the crown, and to take mercy on the poor souls for whom this hungry war opens his vastly jaws, and on your head, turning the widow's tears, the orphan's cries, the dead man's blood, the pining maiden's groans, for husbands, fathers, and betrothed lovers that shall be swallowed in this controversy. This is his claim, his threatening, and my message. Unless that all fam be in presence here, to whom expressingly I bring greeting to. For us, we will consider of this further. Tomorrow shall you bear off our full intent back to our brother England. For the Dauphin, I stand here for him. What to him from England? Scorn and defiance. Light regard, contempt, and anything that may not misbecome the mighty sender. Thus says my king. And if your father's highness do not in grant of all demands at large, sweeten the bitter mock you sent ma his majesty. He'll call you to so hot an answer of it, and return your mock in second accent of his ordinance. Say, if my father render fair return, it is against my will, for I desire nothing but odds with England. To that end, as matching with his youth and vanity, I did present him with the Paris ball. He'll make your Paris Louvre shake for it, and be assured you'll find a difference, as we as subjects have in wonder found between the promise of his greener days and these he masters now. Tomorrow shall you know our mind at full. Dispatch us with all speed, lest our king come here himself to question our delay, for he is footed in this land already. A knight is but small breath and little pause to answer matters of this consequence. Where is Montfleet Herald? Speed him hence. Let him greet England with our sharp defiance. Up, princes, and the spirit of honor edge more sharper than your swords. Hide in the field. Far hairy England. Rush on his host as doth the melt of snow upon the valleys. Go down upon him. You have power enough. Bring him up, prisoner. This becomes great. Sorry I am. His numbers are so few. His soldiers sick and famished in their march. For I am sure when he shall see our army, He'll drop his heart for the sake of fear, and for achievement offer us his ransom. Then haste on, Montoy, and say to England that we sent to know what willing ransom he will give. Now, Lord Constable and Prince Resolve, and quickly bring us word of England's fall. My horse bound from the earth, as if in entrails were hairs. No, my one I bestride it, my sword, I am a hawk. He trots the air, he is pure air and fire, and the dull elements of earth and water never appear to him. But only patient stillness while his rider lasts. Indeed, my lord, is most absolute, excellent force. What shall I know of thee? Thus says my king, say that Harry of England, though we seem dead, we did but sleep. Advantage is a better soldier than I. <coughs> Tell him we could have rebuked him at Harfleur, but we thought better not to bruise an injury till it were full right. Now we speak upon our cue, and our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly, see his weakness, and admire our sufferings. Bid him therefore consider of his ransom. Brightest grace, his own person, kneeling at our feet, is but a weak and worthless satisfaction. To this, add defiance, and tell him for conclusion he hath betrayed his followers, whose condemnation is forever. So far, my king and master, so much my offer. So thus we often spare Turn thee back and tell thy king I do not seek him now. My people of the sick, mud and feeble. Go, therefore, tell thy master, here I am. My ransom is this fray and worthless trunk. My army but a weak and single guard. Yet, God before, we shall come on. If we may pass, we will. If we hinder, we shall. Your tawny ground, your red blood is color. Go. Yet, Montjoy, the sum of all our answers is but this. We will not seek a war, as we are now, 
nor as your we shall not come. I shall deliver so thanks to your highness. Hope they will not come upon us now. You're in God's hands, brother, not there. <laughs> Once more I come to know thee, King Harry. If for thy ransom thou wilt now compound, for thou must assure it overthrow. I pray you, bear my former answer back. Make him achieve me and sell my foe. Let me speak frank. Tell the constable we are but boys for working day, not a piece of feather in all our hopes. Yet, by the mass, our hearts and our trips. Come no more for ransom, Gendelera. Thou shalt have none, I swear, but be my choice. And so fare thee well, thou never shalt hear Harold any more. <coughs> Angry since I came to France until this day. Why not the horsemen on Yacht Hill? If they may fight, beat them down, or avoid the field to offend our sight. That cut the throat of those we have. Do not a man among them shall taste our mercy. Here comes the herald of the French, my liege. His eyes are humbler than they used to be. How now, Harold? Didn't I not tell you of buying these bones of mine for ransom? Comest thou again for ransom? No, great king. I come to thee for charitable license. That we may wander over this bloody field to look our dead and then to bury them. For many of our princes lie drowned in soap and mercy and area blood, as were our bold adventures to our present ones in the blood of the princes. Oh, give us leave, great king, that we may view the field with safety and dispose of their dead bodies. I tell thee truly, Harold, I know not if the day we are to know, yet many of your horsemen appear and gallop over the field. The day is yours. Praise be God, and not our strength for it. Tell me, what is the name of the castle on yon hill? They call it Agincourt. Then call we this the fields of Agincourt, fought on Crispin's day. Go with him, and bring me just numbers of the dead on both our hearts. Uh, a stage savvy director, costumer, and actor. She has done Shakespeare here, notably Fest in Twelfth Night, and has done numerous cabarets and one woman, one woman shows in other venues. Once a child actor herself, she has a special affinity to the Young Actors Workshop, and we are so proud and happy to have her with us again. Brooke. <laughs> the thing I have to say is that I've been working with the Shakespeare Guild and with the Young Actors Workshop since we started. I'm now, you know, beginning to feel generationally lapped on it. Um, and every year it is an honor and a privilege to get to work with these kids. It's just marvelous. I also have to say that due to the fact that the characters in Midsummer Night's Dream spend a lot of time sleeping in a damp wood, some of them were a little sniffly today, <laughs> but they came anyway. Cunning more and more. When truth kills truth, O devilish holy prey, these vows are Hermia's. Will you give for her? I had no judgment when to her I swore. Nor none in my mind. Now you give for her. Demetrius loves her, and he loves not you. Kids, Demetrius, fuck. <laughs> 
all hell dark near perfect divine to what my love shines in bed. Lana. Oh, let me kiss that place of pure white, the snow of bliss. Oh, spite, oh, hell, I see you all bent. Set against me for your merriment. Can you not hate me as I know you do? But must join in souls to mock me too? If you were men, as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so, to vow and swear and super praise my parts, when I know you hate me with your hearts. You both are rivals in love, Hermia, and now both rivals to mock Helena. Demetrius, you are unkind. Be not so, for you love Hermia. This you know I know. And with all good will, with all my heart, and Hermia's love, I yield you up to my part and yours of Helena. To me be with to my do love and will to my death. Never did mockers waste more idle breath. Blossom, you thief of 
love? What? Have you come by night and stole my heart's love from him? Fine and fake. Have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? Fie, fie, you counterfeit, you puppy, you. Puppet? Why so? Aye, that way goes the game. Now I perceive that she hath made compare between our statures. She hath urged her height, and with her personage, her tall personage, her height, forsooth, she hath prevailed with him. Have you grown so high as esteem, you climb so dormish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maple? Speak, how low am I? I'm not yet so low, but that my nails can reach into the eye. I pray you, gentlemen, though you mock me, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all in shrewishness. I am the right maid for my cowardice. Let her not strike me. You perhaps may think, because she is something lower than myself, that I can match her. Lower? Hark, again! Good Hermia, be not so bitter with me. I ever did love you, Hermia. And now will you let me quietly go, to Athens where I bear my foley back. Follow you no further. Let me go. You see how you see how simple and how fond I am. Why get you gone? Who is that hinders you? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. What? With my sander? The meat curious. Be not afraid, he shall not harm thee. Helena. <laughs> Oh, when she's angry, she's keen as true. She was a vixen when she went to school. Though she be but little, she is fierce. Little again? Nothing but low and little. Will you suffer her to flout me thus? Let me come to her. <laughs> Get you gone, you dwarf, you feed, you acorn! <laughs> star in our firmament. <laughs> but I have to warn you, ego the size of New Hampshire. Anyway, Mary Catherine has been doing a Young Actors Workshop also since its inception and has directed probably an even dozen of the main stage productions here and at the Field Theater. So our show today I will hand over to Mary Catherine and it is called Love Actually. what is love? Love is kind, love is patience, love is all you need, love is blind, love is in the air. Our scene today gives us a few other glimpses of love. It's Valentine's Day. Through Shakespeare's indelible characters. A dying queen speaks of a dream. A Verona teenager awaits the secret arrival of her new husband. A doctor's daughter yearns for a nobleman's love. A princess, defying her father, mourns her husband's departure. A wealthy and accomplished lady surrenders herself and all she cares for love. Playing these characters today are Charlotte Curley as Cleopatra, Miley Gucci as Juliet, Rachel Merowaren as Helena, Eva Young as Imogen, 
and Katie Bryan as Portia. Near the end of Antony and Cleopatra, Antony, wounded by his own hand, dies in the arms of Cleopatra. Knowing she herself must soon die, she speaks to a sympathetic follower of Caesar about her dream. I dreamed there was an emperor Antony. Oh, such another sleep that I might see, but such another man. His face was as the heavens. Therein stuck a sun and a moon, which kept the course enlightened. Little <coughs> older, his legs bestrid the ocean. His weird arm crushed the world. His voice was property as all the humans feared. And that's a friend. But when he went to quail and shake the orb, whose rattling thunder, for his bounty, there was no winter. In autumn, in and autumn, twas the crew by reaper. Twas the crew the more by reaper. His delights were dolphin They showed his back, they showed his back above, the element that lived, that they lived in. In his livery walked crown and crowner, realms and islands where his plate dropped from his pocket. Think you there was, or might be, such a man as this I think of. The star-crossed lovers in Romeo and Juliet have defied their parents and secretly married in Friar Lawrence's cell. There was no honeymoon trip for them, but that night Juliet alone awaits her new husband. Come night. Come, Romeo, come thou day and night, for thou wilt lie upon the wings of night, whiter than new snow on a raven's back. Come, gentle night, come, loving black-browed night, give me my Romeo, and when he shall die, take him, and cut him out in little stars, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night, and pay no worship to the garish sun. Oh, I have bought the mansion of love, but not possessed it. And, though I am sold, not yet enjoyed, so tedious is this day, as is the night before some festival, to an impatient child that hath no ropes, but may not wear them. <coughs> oh, here comes my nurse, and she brings news, and every tongue that speaks but Romeo's name speaks heavenly eloquence. In All's Well That Ends Well, Helena is the orphan daughter of the greatest doctor of the age. She becomes the ward of a countess and has raised near her son the young Count Bertram. Hopelessly in love with him, she realizes that marriage to him is out of the question. He is far above her station. The countess speaks to Helena about her dead father and then departs. Helena is alone. I not on my father, and these great tears grace his remembrance more than those I have shed for him. What was he like? I have forgotten him. My imagination carries no favor in but Bertram. I am undone. There is no living, none, if Bertram be away. For all one that I should love, write a particular star, and think to wed it. He is so above me, his bright radiance and collateral light, must I be comforted, not in his fear? The ambition in my love thus plagues itself. The hind that would be made if by the lion must die for love. Twas pretty, so plague, to see him every hour, sit and draw, his arched brows, his hawking eye, his curls, in our heart's table, heart too capable of every line and trick of his sweet favor. But now he's gone, and my idolatrous fancy must sanctify his realm. In Cymbeline, Princess Imogen has defied her father and married Posthumus, a poor but worthy gentleman. The king banished Posthumus, and Imogen mourns because she was not there to see him off. I would have broke mine eye strings, cracked them, to look upon him till the diminution of space had pointed him sharp as my needle. Nay, followed him, till he had melted from the smallest of a gnat air, and have turned mine eye and wet. 
I did not take my leave of him, but it was pretty things to say. Ere I could tell him how I had think on him in certain hours, such thoughts and such, or have made him swear the sheets of Italy should not betray mine interest and his honor, or have charged him at the sixth hour of morn, at noon, at midnight, to encounter me with Orson, then I am in heaven for him. Or ere I could give him that parting kiss which I had set betwixt two charming words, who was in my father, and like the tyrannous breathing of the north, shakes all our buds from growing. Portia is most famous for the courtroom scene in Merchant of Venice, the quality of Mercy's speech, and her parsing of the law to save Antonio. But she had her own story too, didn't she? Her dead father's demand that she search for a husband who would choose the right casket and win her hand. Bassanio proved that all that glisters is not gold and found Portia's portrait in the leaden casket. She speaks to him. You see me, Lord Bassanio, where I stand, such as I am. Though for myself alone, I would not be ambitious in my wish. To wish myself much better, yet for you, I would be trebled twenty times myself, a thousand times more fair, ten thousand times more rich, that only to stand high in your account. I might in virtue, beauties, livings, friends, exceed account, but the full sum of me is sum of something which determine growth. It's an unlessened girl, unschooled, unpracticed. Happy in this is that she is not yet so old, but she may learn. Happier than this is she was not bred so dull, but she can learn. Happiest of all is that her gentle spirit commits itself to yours, to be directed as from her lord, her governor, her king. Myself and what is mine, to you and yours is now converted. But now I was the lord of this fair mansion, master of my servants, queen or myself, even now. But now, this house, these servants, this same myself are yours, my lord. I give them with this ring. Beneath the surface of these love stories lurks the recurrent theme of father-daughter conflict. Juliet's feuding father, Imogen's banishing father, Portia's demanding father, Cleopatra's despotic father, and poor Helena's dead father. <laughs> Our actors have a final word on this subject, an original ode written by Katie and Miley entitled, <coughs> Bad Dads. <laughs> Some, Some of us had really bad dads. Some, Some of us had really bad lives. All of us, all of us, all of us, all of us have given our hearts away for love. But we all had bad dads. <laughs> Our last director, Alan Harbaugh, a software developer at Winter Third. He's a familiar figure in the uh, Wilmington theater scene. He's on the board of the Wilmington Drama League and has been on our stages in Henry IV, The Tempest, and my favorite, Laertes in Hamlet. Uh, in April, he will be appearing uh, in Noises Off at the Everett Theater. Please welcome, once again, Alan Harbaugh. Um, in all this announcing, something that may have got left out was the fact of Mary Catherine. I, I don't know if Mary Catherine came out and gave a speech about herself. Yes, um, she did. Oh, well, <laughs> I skipped that then. <laughs> but many thanks to Mary Catherine for, you know, organizing, um, running the auditions, um, directing here, uh, being the guild mistress, all of that. Um, it's so much work, and we really appreciate it. So we want to end this with a laugh, so we're going to do Macbeth. I know how funny that, that seems to be. So, um, so sit back, get ready to enjoy. Um, the funny thing about the Scottish is they love three things. They love fighting, they love golf, and they love fighting about golf. 
So we're going to try and mix that in, so, so watch for it. All right, so welcome to the second annual Scottish Natural, whoop, the second annual Scottish National Tournament here at the beautiful fairways in the rolling hills outside Castle Dunsinane. You may remember last year's tournament when the Scots team, led by King Duncan, easily defeated the Danish team. <laughs> this year they faced the English team, led by Seward and his young son, Young Seward. <laughs> Seward? Young Seward. <laughs> Got it? All right, rolling right along. This year, Scottish roster has seen some dramatic changes. Last year's best player, Macbeth, is now team captain, while King Duncan has been cut from the team. Literally cut from the team. <laughs> Duncan's son, Malcolm, fearing that he would also be cut, joined the English team. King Macbeth also cut Macduff's family, and they weren't even on the team. <laughs> so, Macduff joined the English team, which left only loyal Seton to help out Macbeth on the Scottish team. Got it? <laughs> All right. The announcers and color commentary for today's matchup will be provided by these three. And they, go, go, go. <laughs> and they really need no introduction for these three. Thank you and enjoy.
fare you well. Make all our trumpets speak. Give them all breath. Those clamorous harbingers of blood and death. I must fight the course. What is he of not woman born? I am to fear or not. What is thy name? Thou will be afraid to hear it. No, though thy coast thyself a hotter name than any is in hell. My name's Macbeth. The devil himself cannot pronounce a title more hateful to my ear. No, nor more fearful. Abhorrent tyrant, with my sword, O crew, thou speakst his voice. <laughs>
our show. Please join us for some refreshments and talk back to the actors and directors. Once again, I thank Alan and Henry and Brooke and Valerie and Mary Catherine, yeah, for <laughs> wonderful performances. Make sure to give us a little donation on your way out, and if you wish to sign up and be a patron, that would be so lovely. We would love you forever. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming.